so let me introduce the next speaker, whom I, I guess personally, I don't know him, um, Dong Hee Kim. Um, Which I know you from. Oh, you do. I was oh, postdoc been... in Pipe Thomas School. Ah, oh, you were in Pipe's group. Ah, yeah. I did. Okay. Uh, when when did you uh, when did you leave Alto? Oh, like seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, years. yeah. Yeah, actually, we have a new uh, prof, uh, Jose Ladell, and mm -hmm. we've been working on uh, on these spin chains. Uh, we actually okay. are, have a couple of papers out on mm -hmm. coherences and stuff. So I'm looking forward to the talk. So you're going to be talking about the light cone spreading yeah. in the Heisenberg XZ chain. I will. Uh, can you see the chat? Um. Uh. Sorry. Um. Yes. I'm so I, yes. So chat. it's uh, it's thirty five plus ten. So I'll give you mm -hmm. a mark at the thirty five uh, minute mark, um, depending on how things go, and, and then okay. you have thank you maximum five minutes. Uh, we're going to be a bit flexible because of the format, so mm -hmm. don't worry too much. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tapio, and I'd like to thank all organizers for inviting me. And today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, light cone, actually perturbative calculation of light cone in strongly uh, disordered excessive chain. Uh, why? Okay. Okay, here's the outline. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction of the MBL, many body localization. And I'm going to show you some table of features that distinguishes quantum thermalization and MBL and usual uh, Anderson localization. And the focus of my talk is actually logarithmic information spreading and how to measure it. And um, the uh, quantity that can measure uh, is uh, one of the tools to measure it is uh, entanglement entropy and the other is out of time order commutator or so-called OTOC or OTOC, and I'm going to explain it. And then are going to, uh, I'm going to move on my results on the calculation of OTOC in the MBA phase of disordered excess chain. i am briefly introduce the, my previous work, which is about the gross behavior, uh, but that's not the main thing. The reason I'm introducing it, it has, it has some idea to connect to perturbative uh, derivation, which is the main core of this talk. Okay, um, what's MBL? There are usually, there are two usual ingredients of MBL. The first one is disorder. It could be on-site energy or hopping, or you could give a quasi periodicity in the underlying lattices. I'm saying it's usual because there are uh, disorder-free MBLs as well, but I'm just, focusing on the usual type of MBL. And the other ingredient of inter interaction, without interaction, it's just uh, endosome localization. So uh, my naive picture of MBL is just endosome localization plus uh, interactions. But this interaction is essential. Uh, it causes so-called dephasing phenomena, which uh, sort of lowers the barrier between the local integral of motions so the uh, information can spread all over the system with this uh, exponentially decaying effective interactions. The, I'm considering the one type of Hamiltonian here. This is just X axis, just chain. Uh, here's the interaction, which is uh, exchange term. And the disorder part is here in the Gman term. The disorder strength is the one of the key thing. If you increase the disorder strength, it uh, undergoes phase transition from the thermal phase to the MBF phase. But I'm mostly playing in this area. Okay, here's a table from a review paper published uh, five years ago, which is really nice. It, it lists up uh, all features that can distinguish thermal and endosome localization and MBL. Uh, the memory effects and the uh, ETH test, like um, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and the transport phenomena, you could easily distinguish the localized phase and the thermal phase because it, fa it fails one place and it, it survives one place. So there's a transport in the uh, 
thermal phase and there's no transport in the localized phase. But it's hard to, in this table, it is hard to distinguish the endosome localization, single particle localized phase, and many body localized phase with this usual type of the uh, uh, measures. Uh, there's only one thing that you can distinguish the two is uh, spreading of entanglement. So in endosome localization, there is no spreading of entanglement. While in the uh, MBR phase, there is slow spreading of entanglement, which occurs in logarithmic time scale if you measure it from the non-entangled initial condition. But I'd like to add one more, the uh, so-called out of time order commutator or talk in this table. So what's auto? Uh, it actually a very old quantity. It, it was introduced many, many years ago by uh, Rakin and Obchinikov in their, uh, it was probably the disorder superconductor paper, I remember. And it resurrected like 10 years ago in, uh, and then became really popular in many areas of the uh, physics. And, and in, in, in it gets into, it got into the MBA studies around 2017, then there are many papers published based on this uh, at all. And it looks like this. Basically, you need two local and unitary operator to define the auto. With these two operators, uh, you can uh, write down the square commutator like this. And if you measure it with some initial state or some st state for measurement, and then you can uh, get the uh, OTOC at all. So if you see the meaning of this, uh, it's basically I uh, set this operator here and let it time evolved and it spreads somehow. And then it makes overlap with the, uh, the other operator here. And then now the commutator is non-zero. Originally at initial time, it's local operator, they are local operators. So commutator should be zero, but now they are increasing at finite time. So if you look at the uh, gross behavior or et cetera, you can somehow characterize the phase in terms of the uh, information spreading. And you might wonder why is out of time ordered? I guess that's, that came from the uh, four point correlator form of expression of this uh, quantity. So you can rewrite this quantity in this form and there's a F function is written in terms of the uh, four point correlator. Obviously it's not time ordered. Right. Okay. Uh, sorry, Dong Hee. Can I can yes. quickly ask you one question? Sure. So, uh, how sensitive are these otoks to the state with which you average? Sorry. So uh, there's an averaging in a procedure in these. Uh, I sure. Right? Yeah, that that's which, part of one part of my talk actually. I see. Okay. So I. So in, in yeah. So the question was how sensitive are the OTACs, OTACs to that? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So to get the uh, basic idea, uh, let me give, let me show some animations. So it's x axis chain, and I'm in the uh, thermal phase now with these operators. Uh, is there's a one operator here and there's another operator there, and I let it uh, time for it. And there's an interaction turned on, and the the uh, disorder strength is pretty small. And it's known that it's in the thermal phase, okay? And these squares are just a matrix representation of these two operators. So it, it's, um, it's in the basis of the uh, folk, uh, states or the spin C basis. And originally the uh, commutator is zero. So it starts there. But if you look at the WT, it spreads so fast. So the uh, CT or top reaches at, ten, reaches at one and saturated really fast. If I move on to the other parameter range, so I turned off the interaction now and increase the disorder strength. And we know that it's in the Anderson localized phase. So let's see. See, auto doesn't grow at all. 
So if you look at the matrix representation of WT, it's pretty much localized. And then you can get uh, CT increased from one. So, so it's zero. This, so this means they don't really communicate, but then if the, if the localization length is, uh, is small, you, yeah, or, or say it's large, you could still have communication within the localiza localization length, right? Oh, even, yeah. Even, yeah. So how do you distinguish that from the, the thermal phase then? If, do you have to check this for, for different? That's uh, why we have to increase, this. increase the distance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you need some, you know, large distance to distinguish them basically. And, and that's the part of the, uh, that's the idea of the right cone, I guess. Okay. In the many body localized phase, uh, if then, then, uh, where I turned on the interaction with a pretty strong uh, disorder. Then the remember to see that it's uh, notice that it's the uh, logarithmic time scale. In the logarithmic time scale, it actually increases, even if the uh, disorder strength is quite large. So it it stays at zero at a very early time, but eventually it increases. So it distinguishes MBF from the uh, AL. Okay. So that's now because, let me... because in the MBL you have you do have many body correlations that eventually come to play. Is that is that the physical explanation? Oh well, the uh, I think standard explanation is so called dephasing phenomenon. Oh, okay. Which okay. is something like I in my understanding, which is something like the many body correlations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now let me uh, compare the uh, entanglement entropy, which is more traditional quantity to uh, study MBL and I'll talk. Uh, the first one is gross behavior. Entanglement entropy has very characteristic uh, gross behavior in logarithmic time scale. So it came in a uh, numerical study first, in the, from the numerical study first. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's accepted chain and they calculated the uh, entanglement entropy gross. And as you can see here, it's logarithmically growing, but it's numeric, so you can you can't say that for sure. But there's other uh, work coming up to explain this phenomena by using the uh, perturbation theory with a weak interaction and RG, and then eventually there's a so the effective Hamiltonian developed, which is called as Elbin model. So. In the uh, entanglement with the entanglement entropy, this logarithmic growing behavior, growth behavior, is pretty well established. In the OTOC, which came, came relatively recently, the average disorder average of CT or tau, uh, it says it pr is proportional to T square. It's derived from the uh, effective either Hamiltonian actually. But if you look at the numerics in the x-axis chain, it's hard to say. This is the same paper. They did both, the, the derivation from the uh, effective Hamiltonian, and then they calculated in the x-axis chain. It's hard to say it's T-square. It might be, it, it might be not. I did it myself, and I put it in the log log scale. Definitely it's not the T-square because it's not, it's not linear. Right in the log log scale. So what's wrong? And that was the first question. And the second one is the uh, logarithmic light cone. And, and there's a general argument in the MVR phase, which is uh, on which is from the unpublished paper. It's in the uh, it's cited really many times, but still in the archive. I don't know why. Uh, it drives this uh, expression with some assumption. Basically, it looks like OTOC. And it says that to get the uh, same level of entanglement, uh, the uh, information spreading or the level of OTOC, at larger distance, you need to wait a longer time in logarithmic scale. So if you equate this one with constant, you get a uh, log T, of is proportional to X. And it's tested with entanglement entropy some years ago with a TMRG X technique. And they got uh, this type of the uh, logarithmic uh, light cone. 
and it's, it's entanglement entropy measurement after local quench. So giving a quench, and then the, later they uh, measure the local entropy. In the OTOC, from the Elvin model, uh, we have this result from the uh, this uh, reference. So it gives you a clear logarithmic light cone, but in but in the uh, render in the numerics in the in the more realistic uh, the quantum spin chains, uh, it's a bit blurred. I mean, it looks like logarithmic uh, light cone if you see here, but it's hard to say in this. Uh, scale of the uh, system size. If you, for instance, if you go longer, what can happen is might be something different or same. So we need more tests. I mean, more, having more tests is not better. So the goal in uh, our work is to study this OTOC features, the gross feature and logarithmic light cone features without the aid of the uh, Elvin model. So we are trying to uh, derive it from a little bit of analytical treatment uh, to confirm this phenomena and see why this is not happening in numerics. So let's first uh, see the gross behavior of OTOC. Why is different from the T square? Uh, this is an access to chain. I put my operator here and there. It is a sigma x operator. And background in this plot is number of data points of uh, same CT, basically. So I traced many, many uh, disorder realizations and every disorder realization gives different CT. And if, if they get into the same pixel and you get higher density. So that's the uh, meaning of this uh, color bar. And as you can see, uh, the background image and this, uh, the dashed line, which is the average of OTOC, is quite different. I mean, can you say what's the average from this background image? So it's a bit uh, strange to say uh, the average behavior in this plot because it really depends on uh, disorder realization. So I think that answers your question. Uh, so if you look at here, some is already saturated. Some disorder realizations get it already saturated, but with some other, many other uh, disorder realizations, OTOC is still around zero. So mm. averaging them gives nonsense. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And then it's tested on this parameter range. And this behavior is really different from what we see in the uh, thermal phase. If you decreased the disorder strength, then you can get the uh, thermal phase. And there, the evolution of this, uh, the distribution of the uh, OTOC is more like bell shape. And this peak moves slowly in linear time scale by keeping the shape of the distribution. But in the ambient phase, it's more like bimodal. So the zero has larger population here. And then there's one, some population one, and it decreases and it increases. So it's change of the bimodal shape. So double peak structure appears in the MBA phase. Then what's happening? So we decide to trace every single uh, individual disorder realization and to see what's happening. Um, what we found is something like this. So the uh, growth of the CT at all uh, comes in many, uh, some different uh, stages. So here is very, very early time behavior. It shows power all actually. And you can derive it with uh, the uh, early time perturbation. And it's two R, R is separation between the two operators. And if you look at the formula, and you can immediately notice that it's nothing to do with MBL. It's just a property of the uh, spin chain. You can have it even without interactions, for instance. So this is not essential phenomena for, to MBL. And later, it has another growth in OTOC, which looks another power row. And if you measure it, it's 
the exponent is around two. The question is, is it really, really relevant to uh, MBL? Is it something we got, we expected from the effective value model or not? So this is the uh, actual, the data point of the, in the intermediate time cross. So if you uh, give a carpet, it really looks like T square, but you can't say that the exponent is exactly two because it's fitting, right? So you have more uh, rigorous theory or detailed theory, theoretical treatment. So from this figure, I can write down from just figure in this form, there is uh, some uh, offset and, that, and there's an increase of the uh, T-square, but that's just a from the figure, we need a theory. To see it more in more detail, we decided to look at the eigenstate OTOC. Because before, the, the, in the previous slide, the state that, that I measured, the state that uh, we used to measure the OTOC is infinite temperature state. Infinite temperature state or maximally mixed state is just the average over the eigenstate. So we, we, we are now trying to uh, trace the eigenstate OTOC, which is measured at each eigenstate. And it's just uh, written like this. It's just a spectral decomposition, or you can make it in any ways. So this S component, S alpha, beta, gamma, delta components gives you uh, the uh, magnitude of the spectral component. And this energies gives you a frequency. So what's different from the uh, Fourier transformation is that the summation of this coefficient is always one. If you check it, uh, if you want to check it, you can just put t equal to zero. If t is zero, the c is one, right? So to cancel it out, you have to get uh, the summation of this one equal to one. And what we found, the measurement of this one, is that there are some dominant modes. So the S alpha beta gamma beta delta, this coefficient are very inhomogeneous. And in most cases, we have just a few dominant components. And in, in some cases, it's really close to one. In that case, we can reduce this equation like this with just a few uh, smallest the dominant uh, order of the S. So this uh, small uh, S gives you a fast component. Actually, if you look at the uh, relation between the W and S, and W is larger here, so it gives you a faster component, it makes offset. And the few largest uh, dominant mode has a smallest uh, omega, and it gives later increase of the OTOC. If you have just one dominant component in the ideal case, and you can reduce this equation in that form, right? With canceling up this, and this is just one. And it's then exactly same as what we have in the Elbin model. So the deviation from the Elbin model's expectation is because there are more components. And SI is not one exactly in the XX just chain, at least in this parameter range. And that gives us some idea for a perturbation approach to reproduce the added result from the, uh, with the uh, x axis realistic x chain. What if we have this type of just one component, one, only one dominant component? And we can actually make it uh, in this uh, regime of parameters. This regime of parameters uh, gives you very, very weak hopping tone, not interaction, hopping tone and very strong uh, interaction term. In that case, you can separate the original Hamiltonian into perturbation term and unperturbative un Hamiltonians. The perturbative uh, perturbation is this, this hopping term and the, it's proportional to J, which is very small and unperturbed Hamiltonian is just classical eigenmodal. And the un, then unperturbative wave function or states is just a folk state or spin Z basis, basically. So in that case, if it's just folk state as a, a unperturbed state, 
then there's only one set of the alpha, beta, gamma, delta for every uh, selection of alpha gives the S component one. So you will have this type of nice, just one dominant component appearing in LTOC in this uh, regime of parameter. So if you do the perturbation calculation of this uh, E alpha, E beta, in E delta, and E uh, gamma and delta, then you will also have. You can get the uh, gross behavior and light cone and everything. So here's uh, some of the results. Um, so you can do, you can really try hard to write down every equation to uh, calculate the perturbation of the energy. But actually, we, we, you only need the lowest order of C, which is non-zero. Then uh, you can write down your omega, the frequency, in terms of the, uh, the lowest order uh, perturbation, which is J, some kappa function of, which is a function of probably a distance. If you can write down in this form, and you can write down the OTOC in this form, right? And then to get the uh, light cone, you get with uh, some constant, then you will immediately get this log T equals to uh, proportional to this kappa function. And if this kappa function is linear, then you have logarithmic light cone. So here's a table of allowed uh, lowest orders. Here's the distance between operators. If you increase it, and this kappa function, this uh, allowed uh, non-zero lowest order has some variety. But if you look at the minimum value and the uh, maximum value, it increases somehow linearly. If you, if you look at the lower bound, it's even order behavior, like two, four, four, six, uh, six, eight, eight. But if you look at the uh, largest compound, the largest one, uh, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18, it's linear. So the cup, basically kappa function is then linear, and you have the uh, logarithmic light cone. So it's from the uh, simple, uh, the analysis of the uh, non-zero lowest order without actually calculating it. Okay. Now, let me show um, the sum of the uh, lesson we got from the uh, actual calculation of the perturbations. Now the first one is the left end and right end of the chain outside of the operator range does not contribute to the uh, lowest order at all. So there is no final size effect in this regime of parameter. So meaning that even if you do exact diagonalization with small size of chain, you can trust this much of the uh, results. So you can, you can expand your uh, distance between the operator almost at the end of the chain. And our calculation doesn't have finite size artifacts. And perturbation theory proved it. And the other one is a little more tricky. The lowest order allowed non-zero uh, allowed lowest order of the perturbation depends on only the uh, spin configuration, configuration in this range between the two operators. So what I mean by the uh, spin configuration is configuration of alpha, the uh, state that we can use to measurement for measurement. So for instance, if you set this type of uh, state for alpha and here to your operator, and this is a range of operator. What we found is that this operator range has to be connected with uh, the perturbations. So it has to move like this to connect these two area. This gives you a non-zero perturbation order. And here's a uh, eight operator involved. So it's J8. And in this case, it's even more simpler. It's simpler. So you can move this, this one, this one to here and this one to the other side with this hopping uh, perturbations. Then you can count there are only four uh, perturbation operator involved. 
then you have the uh, J fox. So in that way, for every given fork state, you can calculate allowed the lowest order. So actual calculations is really messy. This is just an example of the uh, one type of alpha, which is just all one, the ferromagnetic state. And then you can get this analytic expression. But the key thing is that it, the uh, coefficient here is J to the two R minus one. So the order of the lowest, the lowest order of non-zero perturbation term is two R minus one, if you choose this one. So what if, uh, the, so the, um, what if, we, if you search the bound of this allowed lowest order, actually you can have it analytically. And here's the uh, results. Uh, let me just move the uh, gallery, okay. The maximum of the allowed lowest order is two times R minus one, as we, as we saw in the previous slide. Minimum, the calculation of minimum is a little more uh, tricky, which I didn't show. If R is even, it's R. And if it, all this R is all, then it's R minus one. So you can draw this line of plot as a fun, the, uh, plot of the lowest order as a function of the uh, distance between the operators. So every uh, points, the every lowest, allowed lowest order has to be contained in these two bound of light cones. Why I'm saying the light cone with this uh, lowest order? Because it's, uh, it gives you uh, the uh, frequency and frequency gives you time scale. And upper bound of operator is corresponds to the ferromagnetic state between these two operators. It can be just all up or just all down and you have this line. The lower bound has more varieties. It can fill with up down, just up down pairs. It's not necessarily antiferromagnetic, just up down pairs. If you bound them with uh, two, oper two spins, then it's done. And then you will get this line of uh, bound. Okay, this is numerical verifications. So we counted the allowed lowest order, but it's really hard to get a higher order perturbation directly by pen and paper calculation. So we uh, borrowed some power of the numerics uh, and exact diagonalization. <clears throat> so this is really omega. Now we calculated omega out of the uh, the uh, perturbation calculations and uh, exact diagonalization. And indeed, we have this two bound. So every allowed omega is inside this bound. And it has error bar, which means that we tested uh, all this all variety of disorder configurations as well. And it gives uh, this bound, this uh, error bar. And if you look at uh, your state, in the numerical calculation is indeed this type of the ferromagnetic state between these two operators in the upper bound and this uh, pair of the uh, spin up and spin down. And one thing I should warn you, if you want to reproduce this uh, calculation, you have to use multiple precision numerics. If the uh, just a uh, precision of the double and flood is not enough for this calculation, you need uh, really a lot of the significant digits. In our case, we kept 100 significant digits uh, in, in calculation of the eigenvalues and everything. Okay. So I said, I, I give error bar from the uh, test of the uh, different disorder realization. Uh, if you look at the distribution, it looks like this. So the average is really well separated in this uh, calculations. So this is the lowest order four and the case with lowest order four, uh, six, if you increase R, it has more uh, lowest orders allowed. And the uh, lower bound and <clears throat> the upper bound increase with different speed. Uh, one thing I should mention is that uh, this is different distribution. So it's not like if I integrate this pigs giving you one, 
this one gives you one, this one gives you one. So uh, I tested every uh, possible state. And if some give four, it goes to here. If some give six, it goes to here. So there is no information of the uh, population of states giving a particular order four. It came later. So you need that information, population of the, uh, the uh, eigenstate or cases giving a specific uh, lowest order to compute uh, the OTOC with, for instance, uh, maximally the uh, mixed state or infinite temperature state because it's average over or eigenstate. Now it turns out that the P comes little above this lower bound. Here is six and here is eight and here is 10 and 10, 12. But if you increase the R, it gets really bell shaped. So I guess the, uh, the average in that case with the infinite temperature state is also meaningful in this regime of the perturbation. So my time is already almost up. So oh, you got a few more minutes if you want. Yeah. So this is now a uh, full picture of the uh, logarithmic light cone. So this is uh, the point of the T star that gives you 0.5 of the auto for every R. So I, I just calculate this line and then put there. This two line of bounds is directly given by uh, the perturbation theory and it matches well. And the line in between is maximally mixed state, beta equals zero. And if you check the error bar, and if you look at the distribution, the average is really meaningful in this case. So we have really a logarithmic light cone. So if I conclude, uh, we have developed some perturbative uh, approach to compute OTOC in the uh, strong disordered excess chain, and which is weak hopping limit rather than weak interacting limit. And in that regime of parameters, and you get only one dominant component in OTOC in spectral decomposition, which is uh, consistent with uh, fully MBL, in other words, Elbin model or phenomenological Elbin model. So if you choose this parameter range, you can reproduce the uh, fully MBL within this uh, perturbation theory. And we, found, we have found that the logarithmic light cone is not just one line, but structured. And we got from, we got it from the, uh, the counting, the allowed lowest orders. And it has clear bound of the fast and slow logarithmic spreading, and it corresponds to specific uh, configuration of the state. Meaning that if you prepare in your experiment, a particular type of the state, you can get this line. Otherwise, you may be wandering around in between. So that might be some experimental relevance of uh, this perturbative uh, calculations. So I guess that's pretty much all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I have a, a small question before um, sure. the other audience. Um, can you say anything about the actual localization transition uh, based on this? Uh, in my work with perturbation calculation, no. Mm, yeah. But in numerics, we found some signatures. Like mm -hmm. um, if you look at the distribution of OTOC and how mm -hmm. it evolves with the time, yeah, uh, we found that the at transition point, the uh, distribution get flattened uh -huh. on the top, mm -hmm. and then it became, became bimodal. So in the thermal in the thermal phase, it's more like Gaussian or bear shaped, and then getting the flat having flat top at the transition point, and then became bimodal. But you still have the same problems as any other approach with finite sure. effects and stuff. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the issue. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's give the floor to uh, to people who want to ask other questions. I don't see other speakers. Uh, Hello. Archak, yes. Archak, yeah, uh, please go ahead. Uh, hi, yeah, so I have a sort of uh, technical question, like just out of curiosity, 
like why is that amazing precision of numerics required Sorry, I'm losing you. Um, no, so why, why do you need like to keep like 100 significant figures to get this? Oh, uh, if you look at this number here, or um, maybe I go back to this omega plot. So this is really small number. If you do the exponent, to the exponent, if you uh, calculate the exponential of this one, the minus e to the minus 100, and it came out of this one. So this uh, energy is not as small, but difference is really small. So without calculating really many, many, many significant digits of this energy, you cannot get this behavior. So it, the uh, round of error ruins everything. I see. But will that uh, sort of, uh, I mean, does that mean that that difference will almost be zero if I increase the system size? Uh, no, it's not zero. It's different from zero. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a numerical problem, whether if we, could, we can uh, catch it or not. Okay, okay. Like, will it be experimentally relevant? Uh, in the sense that we, the experiments also have some precision, right? Uh, yeah, that's another issue, I guess. Yeah. It, I, I guess that's why many of the uh, experiments focusing on the thermal area. Okay. Because time scale is shorter. Okay. okay. Thanks, thanks. This was very interesting. Okay, do we have um, other members of the audience? Juzar, can you see anybody? I, I don't see the list of speaker, the, the audience list here. Let me try to find it. Uh, I, I don't see any raised hands, but no. uh, maybe, maybe just one quick uh, general question. Um, so, of course, your Hamiltonian year was XXZ, but uh, have you thought about just putting, making it non-Hermitian non by adding a simple term? How would you even start with the definition of OTOC? Uh, are these easily generalizable in these cases where you just make the Herm Hamiltonian non-Hermitian, even if it is PT symmetric, you know, such that the eigenvalues are real? Uh, how would well, these um... translate? I don't know right now, but um, okay. yeah, I don't think that's easy answer. Uh, easy, easy question for me to answer right now. Yeah, I was I was just curious about how yeah. these things really translate to these sort of no non or open or systems. Yeah, true. Mm. So Tapia, I don't see anybody's hand up. Yeah, I don't see anything in the chat either. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let guess... me just ask, ask a quick question, guys. Okay, sure. go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, back to this uh, numerical uh, pioneering work with 100 significant digits. I'm just curious, what kind of uh, platform, what kind of uh, uh, uh uh, software did you use uh, to well, do that? There are a few uh, candidates you can consider. Uh, for instance, uh, MPAC, which is developed by the uh, Riken uh, Supercomputing Center. That's one possibility. And the other one, which actually we took, is using the Eigen3, the template library, and the MPFR, this multi-precision. You can, there's, there's a, some uh, unsupported module in Eigen3, so you I can see. just uh, import this MPFR to calculate the eigenvalues. And... Very nice. A long time ago, I was doing something similar using Mathematica uh, mm -hmm. with maybe 150 or so, or even more significant digits, but uh, that was a long time ago. And I guess that running uh, such uh, large matrices would be a big uh, problem there. Yeah. So I see. But the matrix is not that big in, the, in my case. It's just a, you know. Well, what is the rank of the Just matrix? to remove the old finite size effect, in the perturbative regime. So what, what was the rank of the matrix which you were- uh, It's just R equal to 12. It yeah, L is the idea. system size. L is the system size. Uh, system size, uh, uh, we, we uh, divided by the- uh, Wait, so again, so, so the rank of the matrix which you were diagonalizing was 12, you know? No, no, it's uh, 2 to the 12. Wow, it's, this is big. It's like 500 by 500 or something. 600 maybe. 
Okay. But you have to diagonalize all blocks of the uh the conserve the conserve the spin uh in the x axis change. But the largest one is like 600 or 700. I probably have to check my old stuff, but I think it was uh, comparable uh, the ranks of matrices which we did. Mm -hmm. But maybe then again, this uh, in our case, it was a two, two diagonal matrix and here it's maybe a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, just maybe another question, if I may uh, ask about uh, the general philosophy of these autox. So I was always a bit, uh, uh, surprised to see that uh, uh, well the autox are like in, in your case here you apply them to spin models which don't have a nice uh, classical uh, limit as far as I can tell at least but then uh, what if we do uh, take a model which has a nice classical limit uh, where we can compute uh, Lapunov exponents and uh, the whole beauty of them including the entire spectra mm -hmm. and so on uh, would then the autox uh, somehow naturally transform into uh, into uh, uh, slightly corrugated Lyapunov exponents, or or what? What what can you tell us about that? Oh, well, I have zero experience actually about the uh, such a system, but what people believe is that it gives you a, like well-defined Lyapunov exponent and things like that. If you have a classical counterpart. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah, sorry, can I sort of make a comment on that question? Sure. Yeah, so I mean, I so uh, my PhD, like ex PhD, I was as a PhD student, like my PhD advisor, Abhishek Dhar, has a paper on exactly this basically the classical Heisenberg uh, chain where they calculated OTOC. And that was exactly like you can write it in terms of the usual Lyapunov exponents and so on. You can make a connection there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, good, good to know. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have anything in the chat? I don't see anything. Anybody else? What's uh, what's the plan for the remainder? Uh, are you going to are we going to have some final words or or what's the uh, what's the plan? Yes, I mean the final words are by you, Tapio. So <laughs> yes, uh, um, and then, I think right. you should do it. <laughs> uh, you've, been, but, you've been most active here. Well, but I think before that we should thank all of our speakers for today, uh, right? Absolutely, yeah. And the whole week. And, uh, yes, exactly. So let's thank uh, Dong He and all our speakers for the for today for the whole week. And let's see if this works. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, well, even when we normally clap, it just sounds like noise, right, Tapio? Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this actually brings us towards the end of our workshop. And I would like to thank all of you for participating actively for all, to all the invited speakers who gave wonderful talks throughout this workshop. And uh, also, you know, the questions that were raised both in person and in chat were really amazing. Uh, it gave rise to some amazing discussions. We had some really nice discussions even during the poster session. And I hope all of you enjoyed the poster session. It's sort of, uh, Maybe not, it was not a complete substitute to meeting in person, but um, we tried our level best to make interactions happen. Uh, besides these, of course, the first and foremost thanks goes to PCS and IBS for allowing us to you know, organize this event and providing the necessary tools and equipment for us to do this. Our organizing team, which included the visitors program, uh, Jung Wan Ru, and then our uh, coordinators who helped us in sending out so many emails to you guys, notifying you, helping us out at various different levels, Jay He and Gillen. There was IT support, which was provided by Min Yong, who actually here at PCS, we have an entire room where people can actually go and sit and you know watch the workshop uh, sort mm. of live. Um, this was also another beautiful thing that happened. 
Uh, I also would like to thank Jung Rock and Varinder who were sort of technically supporting the uh, entire workshop by recording these talks. So, you know, you, you will be able to probably see these at some point on YouTube and it's all thanks to them that uh, this actually took place. And uh, with those sort of few words, I would like to thank you all once again. Uh, since today is the last day and the timing is not that bad, I think I'll keep the Zoom room open for people just to discuss and chat if you feel like. Yeah. But officially, this marks the end of our workshop. So, thank yeah. You all. Okay.